program, this evening's program is somewhat different from our earlier advertised talk, as Joan Snyder canceled at the last minute due to um, an unexpected medical issue. But we're very, very happy to have with us Marilyn Sims, who curated and organized Joan Snyder print retrospective, Dancing with the Dark, on view until December 15th, upstairs in the Clinton's Gallery. She also organized and contributed to the companion monograph of Snyder's prints, which catalogs nearly 50 years of the artist's graphic work. Sims' work sheds significant light on an aspect of Joan Snyder's career that has not received adequate attention. In providing a lucid biographical context for Snyder, Sims reveals to us a path into Joan Snyder's artistic life. We look forward this evening to hearing her speak in depth on Joan Snyder and Dancing with the Dark. Marilyn Sims is the director of the Morris Research Center for Graphic Arts and curator of prints and drawings at the Zimmerle Art Museum, Rutgers University, a position that she has held since 2006. <coughs> Prior to that, she's had curatorial posts at Smith College Museum of Art, the Detroit Institute of Arts, and the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York, to name just a few. She has an extensive publication record writing on print topics that range from old master works to 21st century printmaking techniques and a host of contemporary artists. Please join me in welcoming Marilyn Sims. So thank you, Michelle and, and Sarah. And it's really um, wonderful to be here at, um, in Albuquerque um, with you all. Joan Snyder asked me to send you her regrets. She very much uh, wish she could have been here, but she is thrilled that her art is on view for you to enjoy. Um, and the Zimmerle Art Museum at Rutgers University could not be more thrilled that the touring version of Dancing with the Dark, the Dancing with the Dark exhibition, celebrating Joan Snyder's innovative contributions to printmaking is now on view here at the University of New Mexico Art Museum. And I want to personally thank the wonderful staff here who made that possible. It's really a beautiful display upstairs. And what you see on the screen is the cover to the book, uh, which is very handsomely produced, I'm proud to say. And as uh, Michelle mentioned, it's the first monograph on Joan Snyder's prints. So I hope you'll take a look at it. I know that there are copies um, available here. Um, and what you can see from the cover, uh, which is a detail uh, from one of her magical series, is that Joan Snyder has evolved into a very painterly printmaker, um, and she obviously adores color. Joan Snyder's prints, like her paintings, expose her passion, pain, rage, sexuality, joy, or sorrow. Like a visual diary, she interweaves her most personal feelings, thoughts, and life experiences to create profoundly affecting pictures that explore humanity and nature with bold choices of colors, forms, and textured surfaces. Joan Snyder is unlike some painters who also make prints, those who might seek a tidy, uniform edition that is easily marketed. Instead, Snyder has a proclivity for variant editions, monoprints, and monotypes, resulting in a printmaking herb that is vexingly difficult to grasp in its entirety and in all of its details. Nonetheless, one can formulate some general observations about her prints, beginning with their open-ended open inventiveness. One feels a very particular engagement in the intensely personal imagery, which is often linked to events in her life or to broader social issues, and in her art's layered complex surfaces and processes. I first visited Joan Snyder's studio in Brooklyn, New York in December 2007, a few months after she received her MacArthur Genius Award. While I was familiar with Joan's paintings from many New York City exhibitions, I thought then that she had only made a handful of prints. At her studio, I saw the full range of Joan's graphic achievement from 1963 to the present. I could scarcely believe that there never had been an exhibition or major book focusing solely on her extraordinary prints. Here's uh, Joan, as you can see, um, with her wonderful studio assistant, Mira Dancy, and they are both standing in front of her, uh, Joan's painting, Oh, April. 
And thank to, thanks to Jones and Mira's vital collaboration on this project, I was able to examine every impression of every print in Jones' studio, literally hundreds of works, so I could select the very best impressions for this exhibition. Joan also kindly permitted me access to her personal diaries and sketchbooks and her extensive archive documenting her career. Dancing with the Dark, uh, the book and the exhibition, would not have been possible without Joan Snyder's dedicated commitment at every stage during the three years it took to realize the exhibition and the book. Joan was unfailingly generous in facilitating every curatorial request and in the process, I am honored that she has become a friend. Mira was also my invaluable partner in carefully documenting a multitude of prints and related books. While Joan would become a pioneering feminist artist in the late 1960s and 70s and afterward, and she still is going strong as a powerful painter and printmaker today, her ordinary New Jersey childhood gave no hint that she was an artist in the making. Born in 1940, Joan grew up in a working class family of Russian Jewish descent in Highland Park near New Brunswick, uh, which is the home to Rutgers University. And these family photographs show a young Joan um, years before she took an art class um, or visited museums. So here's Joan, her mother Edith, her older brother Stephen, her father Leon, and her younger sister Sue Ellen. And here's Joan, about 10 years old, looking very prim, unlike she would, would uh, be in her grown-up years. And then here is Joan um, posed with her high school band. And Joan um, originally started out playing the drums, and then she um, worked on to uh, the clarinet. Starting in fall 1958, Snyder attended Douglas College, then the women's division of Rutgers University. As an undergraduate, she was a sociology major intending to pursue social work as a career. During her senior year, Snyder took her first art class in painting. As Snyder recalled, quote, for months into the course, I realized that I had found something I had never found before in my life, a way to talk about my feelings, and that was the beginning, end quote. She decided to become an artist then and there and never looked back. In 1963, before she started graduate art classes at Rutgers, she rented her first studio space along the Raritan River in New Brunswick. And these are photographs from a local newspaper article about her beginning art career. In the article, Snyder was described as, quote, a serious young artist who resembles the form former movie favorite, Greta Garbo. And <laughs> by the late spring 1963, Snyder had arranged to live with her former sociology professor, Emily Allman, and Allman's husband, David, and their daughter, Jenny, on a farm in Englishtown, New Jersey. The family's rich intellectual life and intense engagement in politics provided a stimulating environment that Snyder found liberating after a conventional Highland Park upbringing. She became very close to the Almonds, who were her mentors and surrogate parents. She made her first expressionist landscape paintings and later a woodcut inspired by their farm, as you can see here. And on the left is her oil paint, painting, Farm Landscape, Yellow House, and on the right is the related woodcut uh, print landscape, which as you can see is roughly carved into dramatic contrasts of light and dark. This is the earliest print displayed in the exhibition. And as this early woodcut and others of this period show, <laughs> Snyder vigorously carved the block with a competence that belied her relative inexperience as an artist. Snyder's largest, most ambitious, and most powerful print from her earliest, early years is this portrait of Emily, Emily Allman. As you can see, the woman's face is deeply furrowed, um, as if in deep, deep worry. As Snyder expressed, uh, her relationship with her former teacher was complicated. Emily was part mother figure, part confident, part advisor, part crush, part muse. Yet perhaps this portrait is as much projection as characterization. The day Snyder made it, John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. 
and Snyder remembers listening to the evening news on November 22, 1963, and staying up all night carving this woodblock portrait of Emily. In fall 1964, Snyder formally entered the Rutgers MFA program, and in a 2004 interview, she recalled, quote, I had spent 18 years of my life not knowing what I wanted to do. All I knew was that I was very sensitive, very anxious. There was nothing that was making me happy. So when I found painting, it was really literally like speaking for the first time. I set my own assignments. I would make a painting with one figure. Then I would set an assignment to make a painting with two figures." End quote. At around this time, Snyder was artistically exploring female sexuality in her work, and she took her first printmaking course in lithography. And on the screen, you see uh, an early lithograph titled Angel, created in 1966, the year Snyder got her MFA degree. And she, after that, she moved to New York City, where she established her studio and concentrated on painting. And on the left is a 1970 portrait of Joan by her husband, photographer Larry Fink, whom she had married in 1969. During this period, Snyder began creating her flock membrane paintings. These explorations of women's bodies and sexuality evoke inner landscapes in abstract biomorphic imagery. By means of her fleshy textural brushwork and collage, she evolved her own feminist art vocabulary. As Marsha Tucker wrote in 1971, quote, among Joan Snyder's earlier paintings are dissections of human anatomy, not in the traditional sense, but in their expression of flesh, membranes, musculature, and cells as pigment, color, and surface, rather than as symbolic images. Aspects of this style would also carry over to her 1970s intaglio prints. By 1975, when Snyder created this glorious intaglio print called Imagine, she was enjoying a successful career. She had already had several successful solo gallery exhibitions. Her paintings were being included in important museum exhibitions. She was receiving important critical attention from art critics and collectors. She had launched a women, women artist exhibition program at her alma mater, and that exhibition program continues to this day at Rutgers. In this print, which was inspired by Frank O'Hara's poem, Autobiographia Literaria, Snyder created her own poem about color, beauty, symphonies, bodies, and souls. Her poem, as you can see, hand printed on the left panel of this etching, expresses the excitement she felt because her career had taken off and she was living as an artist full time. She talks jubilantly about color, all in this black and white print. In the right panel, the image's evocation of female sexuality emphasizes the intimate bond between her work and her life. Here, Snyder interwove words, shapes, abstraction, and texture to create an art reflecting her own explorations of selfhood. The quest transcended egotism, however. Rather, it was Snyder's way of understanding the essence of what it means to be female and of sharing her experiences and insights with others. She was intent on making women as sexual, political, and creative beings the primary subject of her art. Technically, this print exemplifies Snyder's first use of soft brown etching that permitted her to imprint cheesecloth amid freely drawn lines, an effect that echoed what she was doing in her highly textured, collaged paintings. In 1977, Snyder spent many months painting what would become her epic feminist painting of the 1970s, Resurrection, a monumental painted and collaged eight-panel work now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. The idea for this painting began with the artist's response to news coverage about rape and murder victims. In a 1987 interview, Snyder explained, quote, I was traveling all over the country at the time, giving lectures. I began to read local newspapers, and in every one, there was always a story about a woman being raped, burned, or hurt in some way. So I began clipping stories about violence towards women, 
towards the elderly and towards children. At about the same time, I began feeling as if the farm where I was living was haunted, as if an old woman had been murdered there. I wanted to make a ma major painting about rape and murder, but one that would also somehow was going to lay the old lady to rest." End quote. In another interview, Snyder remarked, quote, the painting became the story of one woman and many women's lives. It was about rape and murder and rage. It was also about the rich life history of a woman, aside from the fact that she was violated. Finally, I had made a painting about someone else's experience, and it was a great release to me, end quote. And on the painting's two left panels, here she lists um, the names of 102 um, victims who had been murdered. And then he, here's a collage of newspaper articles um, overpainted um, in an expressionistic way, as you can see. Here is an angel of death figure, and then the right side is dedicated to the resolution um, and the resurrection um, uh, of all of these uh, souls. In early 1978, Snyder began to make intaglio prints based on her major painting. Resurrection etching, like the painting, is divided into eight sections. I think you can see them here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and both works move from darker areas to light, from violent deaths to peace, where a sun illuminates a scene of resurrection. Thus, Snyder transforms specific narratives about numerous victims into a universal memorial. This etching in Aquitant went through at least nine progressive proofs. That's all we could find in Joan's studio, anyway. And here you see uh, proof four, where Snyder was deliberating about the placement of her expressive strokes and color choices um, via watercolor. And this is the um, final edition of this print, where you can see broad strokes of printed color sweep across the main black and white image, image and extend into the margins. They bring to mind smears, um, as in blood, but also the notion of something taking place beyond physical limits, as in a resurrection, the triumph over death. While the texts and scenes construct a narrative, the color acts with emotional force. Resurrection etching remains Snyder's most ambitious intaglio print. And I hope you'll go upstairs to the exhibition to see it more closely. But again, she repeats the names of the victims here. And these are a photo etching of the collage of newspaper clippings about the victims. Here is the angel of death. And then on the right side, she has this pastoral landscape. And maybe you can make out this cow that's sort of ambling down the hillside right there. And then there's a body um, buried uh, beneath the hills, a farmhouse, and um, a moon shining, and a sun shining. And then on the far right, she is embedded lace. And you can sort of make out a little figure here um, in the lace. And um, these tonalities um, represent uh, the resurrection. Shortly after her daughter Molly was born in 1979, Snyder's marriage unraveled, and she was a single mother raising a young child. This led to Snyder's becoming acutely empathetic to the vulnerability of all children and awakened her maternal protective instincts. In 1983 and 84, Snyder made the most searing woodcuts of her career, returning to the German expressionist style of her earliest prints 20 years before in which he had worked with deliberate crudeness. Her prints reflected inspiration from African carvings and the directness of children's art. In Mommy Why, which you see here, Snyder aggressively cut the woodblock to convey a mother's anguish over being unable to soothe the heart-wrenching cries of her child. Whether the child's despair is due to the loss of a father, due to divorce or death, or because the child is suffering from abuse or illness, or whether the child is having a severe tantrum, Snyder does not reveal. For the addition of this print, Snyder decided to hand color each impression. 
Snyder hand manipulated the coloring with oil paint to vary each impression in the addition of 15 so that no two impressions are exactly alike. And as you can see, gesticulating dramatically in the image are a small child and a naked woman. Her hair, armpit, and vulva colored red as if ablaze. Although the nude mother's face is mask-like and skeletal, her voluptuous body evokes life-giving sexuality. Mommy Y is unsentimental about the struggles of motherhood. In the 1980s, Snyder's prints, as her paintings, vacillated between joyous and painful imagery. The latter often composed of cross-like totems, which were the artist's symbol for the dead and childlike stick figures. In this somewhat ambiguous but dramatic black and white print titled Dancing in the Dark, which inspired the exhibition title, two figures inspired by one of her daughter's drawings hold hands and dance. The figures are surrounded by a wide border filled with ominous totems which resemble grave markers. In the late 1980s, Snyder began creating works in response to a series of Christian Science Monitor articles about suffering children throughout the world. In 1988, Snyder wrote, quote, I sense an almost global destruction of our children because of adult cruelty and indifference. Children are being blown away either by violence of adults caring for them or by land mines left in fields where they play. The exploitation of children by adults through neglect, poverty, war, and violence of all kinds can only leave us with generations of broken children. The pain and suffering that our children are experiencing has obsessed me. My work had to include the children. It has been an almost primitive experience for me of trying to heal them, to hold them, to tell them someone is here." End quote. As a response, she created this woodcut titled For the Children, its open-mouthed crying child with its outstretched arms forming a cross is her symbol for the plight of all the suffering children. In the early 1990s, Snyder experienced the loss of her parents and others close to her, prompting her to create paintings and prints that serve as elegies for the dead. Her painting, Faces of 1993, exemplifies her artistic response to those who tragically died of AIDS. And in this work, Snyder incorporated woodcut images of ghost-like uh, faces printed on fabric, as you can see here. After, oops. After using some for the painting, Snyder printed many more heads from several different woodblocks on fabric fra fragments of varying sizes and colors, which he then incorporated into a series, uh, a, into a unique installation piece titled Soul Series, which is on display uh, in the exhibition. Snyder's haunting piece of 1993 is always displayed with uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay's poem, Dirge Without Music, a poignant eulogy that concludes, down, 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 into the darkness of the grave, gently they go, the beautiful, the tender, the kind, quietly they go, the intelligent, the witty, the brave, I know, but I do not approve, and I am not resigned. Much of Joan Snyder's work is inspired um, by poetry, she's an avid reader, you'll see the use of language a lot in her work. It is um, this moving tribute to the talented lives lost to young, um, uh, and in the exhibition you'll see that the heads sort of seem to levitate between our material world and the spiritual world beyond. And when you are in the exhibition, I'll hope that you'll notice this particular wood, um, howling head in particular, you can see it better here in this detail shot, uh, which uh, shows you a few of the uh, details from souls. Snyder uh, occasionally combines images from different works, as you saw with the Faces painting and the, the Soul series. And another notable example of her recycling of, of uh, one of her howling heads is used in this piece, um, which is a recasting of her color woodcut Mommy Why. 
This is called Three Faces, Mommy, Why Two? Dates from 1993. And as you can see, here's the howling head, um, which is um, on a fleshy, robust nude in a cherry strewn garden rendered in freely stroked monotype. This print was Snyder's response to the anguish of mothers who must witness their AIDS afflicted children wasting away. In her characteristic style, Snyder addresses mortality by juxtaposing the specter of death with a vivid nude, whose somewhat ambiguous pose simultaneously suggests both giving birth and a contemporary pieta. Occasionally during this <coughs> period, Snyder purged her thoughts of lost souls and doing painful paintings and prints by making paintings and monotypes of gardens and fields inspired by the Long Island scenery that surrounded her rural home at that time. In these horizonless landscapes, she focused on the texture of the earth and vegetation. And on the left, you see one of her paintings, Cantata in the Woodfield, and on the right is one of her monotypes, Freshly Plowed Field, which you can see in the exhibition. With Snyder's own small press, starting in 1987, she began an intense flurry of making monotypes. She made dozens and dozens of them. She loved that monotype was ideally suited to her painterly style and adventurous use of color. She explored motifs similar to those in her painting, celebrating nature. So she did many um, showing flower strewn meadows, fertile farm fields, ponds, sensuous nudes, or night landscapes filled with moons. In 1993, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts invited Snyder to produce prints for a portfolio about AIDS. When she began working with master printer Bob Townsend, the portfolio's theme of AIDS and death resonated with her even more profoundly as she was also experiencing deep grief for her father who had just died. It was a period of tremendous sorrow for Snyder, but also a time when Townsend was pushing her to experiment with combining print media, combining woodcut with etching and various methods of applying color by a monotype. And so since that time, she has done many, many um, challenging prints where she has combined different print media. The result for this portfolio were two prints, and on the screen you see Field of Flowers and Field of Moons, which I'll show you next. Um, in this print, vividly colored flowers float above a turquoise oval ring. And at the bottom, top and bottom of the print, you can see that Snyder wrote the phrase, not to make us grieve, but display the changing nature of grief, not to make us cry. Snyder's use of flowers um, obviously refers to a mourner's tribute to the dead, but they also refer to the cycle of life. More somber is Field of Moons, a nocturne with a pool at the center glimmering with the reflected light from moons floating across the picture plane. A pair of orange crosses seem planted on the banks of the pool. While those are Snyder's totem symbol for the dead, the crosses might also be grave markers, or given the AIDS theme, the crosses in this print might also be read as plus signs as an HIV positive. In both prints, the pool of water symbolizes a repository for tears, a soothing healer, and ultimately a source of life. Handwritten names and lists have often been an integral component of Snyder's print imagery and content, as has the verbal and visual interplay of language to express excitement or protest or grief. For her 1995 commission from the Jewish Museum in New York, Snyder decided she would make a print that included the names and histories of every woman who was mentioned in the Old Testament, Jewish as well as non-Jewish women. She also included the names of the women of her own family, including her partner uh, Maggie, her daughter Molly, her grandmother Dora, and her mother's name, Edith, is there as is her sister, Sue Ellen. 
The print is titled Our Foremothers, and it was very complicated to do. It was like a complex puzzle. Snyder had to figure out how to optically balance all the names, and as you see, the names are in different sizes, printed in different colors from top to bottom, side to side, and they seem, and they are, in a random non-hierarchical hierarchical um, composition, and somewhat suggest graffiti on a wall. Snyder admits this is a feminist piece. Her focus on the histories of women in the Bible was on those women who were the ancient pioneers for the rights of women. They fought for, among other things, women's right to own property, women's inheritance rights, women's struggle against abuse. This print, titled My Work, is probably Snyder's most autobiographical print. It presents a marvelous hybrid the image of a heart that's part valentine, part female anatomy, with its blood red and umber radiating lines and pink halation. The central form seems to pulsate with an energy in the middle of a field of floating colors and words. And these words name um, aspects that constitute uh, the subject matter or the materials of her art. You'll see glue, grief, earth, moons, Nails, drips, rust, totems, breasts, fear, blossoms. And should there be any question about the subject of this print, Snyder wrote in emphatic block letters across the bottom, my work has been absolutely faithful to me. The image declares Snyder's integration of art and creativity with female sexuality and sensibility as a source of passion and giving birth to life. Also, the double meaning of work signifies both the earth of the artist and the labor it has entailed. The exhibition displays all the working proofs, and you can see two uh, of uh, the proofs from my work here. Snyder slowly developed the image, images and its color choices. Um, she worked with the master printer, Jennifer Melby, um, who's based in New York. And as you can see, these boldly colored proofs are somewhat tamely articulated. And when you see the final version as it was editioned um, on the left, it, it appears so intuitively made, but it was only realized after much experimentation and exploration of various options. The print is a tour de force combination of various intaglio techniques, scraping, and woodcut. On the right is Snyder's reinterpretation of the subject a year later in a very large painterly print titled And Acquainted with Grief. In this later print, Snyder softened the hybrid forms and they appear as blood red slits amid blossoms and cherries and boldly written words. And so you see the blossoms and these cherries which are her symbols of the cycle of life and mortality. On the left is the 1998 painting titled Crushed Green Light, and on the right is a related monoprint from a series titled In Times of Great Disorder, which Snyder created in the year 2000. Taking on not only the imagery of that painting, but also the practice of mixing materials, Snyder and the printer Andrew Mockler of Jungle Press developed the 18 monoprint series in nine stages, incorporating lithography, monotype, woodcut, relief printing, and pastel. Though they follow an identical compositional format, the prints vary considerably in their specifics from uh, color to service articulation. And two uh, from the series are on display upstairs in the gallery. In her own words, Joan Snyder explained how she came to create the series, quote, in 1999, that was a time of great upheaval for me. Early that year, not only did we sell our house and buy a new one, but simultaneously I had to move out of my studio. It was during this time that I did the monoprint project in times of great disorder. In the painting series that I was working on right before I did the prints, I had begun using round wooden dowels and jewels, both plastic and real. Unlike grids I had used many years ago, now the grid had become not just the structure of the piece, but part of the content. The grids were often painted with thick paint, colors so bright that they cannot be ignored. 
they seem to have a life of their own. The monoprints, as Snyder continues, were born out of these painting ideas, out of a desire to experiment with many different grid and border colors, and then to enhance these beginnings, sometimes to an extreme. Many different plates and blocks had to be prepared in order to achieve the effects that I wanted. In all, there were nine different processes, nine different times that the, each of the 18 prints went through the press. The process used in all three lithographic plates, three woodcut plates, one hand-painted plexiglass plate, plus hand-applied relief printing, and then a final transfer of sprinkling of pastels. Joan continues, I was simultaneously reading what Carl Jung said about making mandalas. Simply put, he said that mandalas appear in times of great disorder. He meant in times of great disorder in the universe, of course, but it was also a time of great disorder in my own life. Another print series that exemplifies Snyder's, Snyder's painterly approach is 33 Madrigals. One monoprint is on the left, as you see, and on the right is a 2001 portrait of Joan in a Brooklyn studio surrounded by several monoprints from the series. Again, in collaboration with Mockler at Jungle Press, Snyder completed this ambitious monoprint series inspired by watching magical singers practicing in a circle formation at a recorder workshop she had attended. Snyder admits that these 33 variant prints also recall mandalas. The series is joyous and uplifting, a welcome antidote to the somber mood that cloaked New York City in the weeks following the 9-11 tragedy. Solidly colored discs or moons surround a luminous central pool or pond filled with abstract blossoms of color. This again shows you the great range of brilliant colors um, that she printed, um, used in this print series uh, as a visual equivalent to music. This print is Oasis, which Snyder created in 2006 at the Brodsky Center for Innovation, Innovative Editions at Rutgers University. And this print is probably distinctive because it was editioned all the same way, which is quite unusual in Joan's work. Um, and as you can see, the image is a dazzling, rippling pool with whirls of blue and aqua and bright red and other luminous hues. The title Oasis reinforces the artist's intent that the image would be a place where one can dwell, a bright and restorative place. Yet Snyder's arriving at the right combination of colors for the final print was not easy. And on the screen you see Joan working on drawing on mylar to make a silkscreen matrix for Oasis. And I also show you the display of the Zimmerle Art Museum that showed the variant working proofs uh, that are in pinks, and yellows, and oranges, so unlike the final. And I thought I would also uh, speak a little about the process of making this print. Um, on the left you see a, a watercolor. Um, Snyder began by developing several watercolors with swirling pool imagery inspired by one of her 2005 paintings of ponds. Master printer Randy Hemminghouse took one of the artist's initial watercolor studies and scanned it into the computer, and then using Photoshop, he and Snyder went through several rounds of adding and eliminating details, as well as experimenting digital, digitally with varying the colors. Next, Snyder painted with the brush and black ink onto the mylar um, sheets, as I showed you there and these served as negatives to make different screens, one for each color. Hemminghouse then screen printed the colors onto the digital proofs, thus enhancing the image with rich tones that seemed to float upon the other. After Hemminghouse spent a day printing proofs, Snyder would take them home to study them, and as she said, worry about them, and then she wrote marginal notes to indicate what changes needed to be made. And again, just to give you a sense of all the various color proofs that poor Randy had to go through, you see there are yellows, there are pinks, there are greens, and then I show you the final edition um, print. 
So what appears so effortlessly gestural and spontaneous is actually an image that Snyder really labored over. Snyder made three glorious prints in 2010, the year she turned 70. Here is Wild Roses, a field of large dusky pink roses in full bloom, alternating with smudgy black curvy forms, which are seed pods. Interspersed are a few words in small off-kilter letters, and yet they're very faint. Here, O Mary and O Bookie, down here. And these refer to the artist Mary Hamilton, who had recently died. Boogie was the nickname that um, Snyder's daughter, daughter Molly had given to Hamilton, who was her babysitter. While the lovely flowers celebrate nature, wild roses also serves as a memorial to the artist's beloved friend. Wild roses is one of Snyder's loveliest prints, as you can see. The content is personal, autobiographical, the forms look as, they, as though they improvise their way into existence rather than emerging from premeditated forethought. Even the overall dusky pink tonality is pure Snyder, Snyder, unapologetic in its feminine, sentimental associations. In Alter, a large, complicated, combined media print Snyder created at Tandem Press in Madison, Wisconsin, Words in large dissolving letters appear amid falling blossoms and pods and cherries and seed um, and boat shaped forms. Um, as Snyder has explained, it's all about the idea of aging and my mental state at the time I made it. I mentioned many different states of the mind and body, like sex, love, fear, anxiety, and death. And here you see sex, ancient anxiety here. This print, See What a Life, is composed entirely of a passage from Henry David Thoreau's journal entry of March 27, 1842. Snyder repeats Thoreau's words so that the phrase appears twice in succession in large, emphatic block letters of various densities and colors against patches of red, yellow, and blue. See what a life the gods have given us, set round with pain and pleasure. Produced in her 70th year, this print proclaims Snyder's great passion for life, a passion albeit tempered by her keen awareness of her own mortality. In conclusion, I would like to read from an essay Joan Snyder wrote in 1991, an essay titled, It Wasn't Neo to Us which conveys the feminist feistiness and energy that has characterized her entire career. In this essay, Snyder declared, I believe that women artists pumped the blood back into the art movement in the 1970s and 1980s. At the height of the pop and minimal movements, we were making other art, art that was personal, autobiographical, expressionistic, narrative, and political. This was called feminist art, this was what the art of the 1980s was finally about, appropriated by the most famous male artists of the decade. They called it neo-expressionist. It wasn't neo to us. They were called heroic for bringing expression and the personal to their art. We were called feminists, which was, of course, a dirty word. Except that it was women who did that. Nancy Spiro did that. Faith Ryan Ringgold did that. Jackie Windsor did that. We did that, and as you can see, John Snyder most certainly did that. Thank you.